Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Only Land Band Show. My name is Kendall Lejeune, and our guest today is Brad DeGraw. Brad DeGraw is a seasoned hard money lender with nine years of experience in real estate lending. As the founder of All Terrain Capital, he provides funding solutions for land investors who have more deals than capital. He funds a range of deals from infill lots, multi-parcel, transactional, and cash-out refinance. Brad is known for his team-oriented approach, structuring creative and flexible lending solutions for land transactions. Brad will share his insights on hard money lending and how it can be used to advance your business growth. With his wealth of experience and understanding of the lending industry, Brad will provide valuable and actionable tips to attendees. Brad, thanks so much for joining us. How are you this evening? I am wonderful. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. I'm super excited because you've been a, a very active member of our community since we got started. And I just hear so many wonderful things about your services. And now we can finally dig in, get some experience and hear from a hard money lender how we can grow our businesses as land investors. And so I'm super excited about that. Um, but right out the gate tell us a little bit about how you got started doing land deals you know i started like a lot of entrepreneurs i just got started i i picked up a book called coffee money real estate uh it's just one of these little 10 five or ten dollar ebooks and it had this idea that you could pick up real estate for fifty dollars in arkansas of all places i said well i don't know if it works or not but let's give it a shot and I ended up buying two dozen parcels in like lake communities for $50 a piece. And so before I knew it, I was, I was waist deep into the land flipping. Wow. Wow. And so when you got started outside of this book, did you have any type of like mentors or how did you learn? You know, I, I peeked at everything out there. Um, like everyone else, I binged the podcast and everything I could find on YouTube and eBooks and all the big names have great content. So I consumed everything I could get my hands on. And also, you know, back during the previous market cycle, like 06, 7, 8, I purchased single family homes. And so I, I knew some of what broadly works and didn't work. Um, but I knew that not everything works for everybody. So I wanted to see kind of what worked for me. Got it. And so single family homes was your was was that actually your first start into real estate in the real estate world? Yep, that was it. And like like everyone taught, you know, you buy it cheap and ugly and you put a little work into it, some sweat equity and everyone's always going to pay on time and they're always going to take great care of your property. And before you know it, you're just swimming in checks every month. You can't stop them. And that wasn't really my experience. Um, one of the residents burned down the property and didn't tell me. So they don't teach you that in the weekend, you know, get rich in real estate course. What do you do when the, the house is half missing? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So, so you did follow a similar path that a lot of people that we've had on this show follow is that they got started in single family homes and then with all of the the beasts and bird, you know, beasts of burden that single family homes uh, brings to the table, sort of guide you into other opportunities, which was land for you, right? Exactly. Yeah, there was a couple lessons we learned out of that. Like, if it can burn, then maybe that's not really the asset. The asset is the cash, not necessarily the structure. From the way I like to look at it, so we had insurance, you know, repaired and replaced the house. And then I sold those properties with seller finance notes, which helped me understand, you know, a new way to be real estate adjacent, have the benefits, several benefits from real estate without necessarily all the headaches. That's really, really good. All right. So I like that. I like that you were iterating and figuring out like, oh, I like this component of the business. I don't like this. How do I get rid of that? And how do I keep this? That's fantastic. And so you started you you started doing were these infill lots these little uh yes yeah yep. so um i ended up buying a bunch of post auction properties in arkansas and my thinking you know i'd, I'd look at the map and i'd say well there's a neighbor at least that's someone who might be interested also you know if there's a neighbor that indicates maybe utilities are available and so i'd just reach out to the neighbors 
And one of the best and one of the worst that helped me move a different direction was I bought half an acre with half a mobile home. And they don't usually sell like that. It's like, think of Swiss cheese where half the roof is gone, half the walls, half the flooring. It was uh, rough. Wow. And um, I sold that thing three times and just new headaches and burdens and challenges each way you could, everything that could go wrong went wrong. And I realized again, hmm, this could work, but it's not working the way it should. I'm going to go another direction. Got it. Got it. So these, you said you picked up like two dozen of these properties. Were they yes. really $50? How much, you know, how much were you paying for these infill lots? Yes. Yeah. $50 a piece. And so things are, you know, it's a moving target. This was back when everything was on paper. You would, um, it's COSL, coastal.org would be the website. It's the Commission of State Lands. And you would scroll down till they're highlighted green and you could make an offer. So usually during the auction, the first offer, the opening bid is whatever the back taxes were, plus some legal fees. But after the auction, if no one bids anything, you can write in an offer. And so I just put $50. You had to write out a check and print out a form and mail it. And I print out a few, nothing happened. A few more, nothing happened. And I was probably over caffeinated one day and I printed out a few dozen and I just wrote a few dozen checks and I said, it's either going to work or it's going to you know, fail, but let's find out for real. And nothing happened. Months later, nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, my wife asked me, what are all these $50 checks coming through the account? Well, they started clearing. So I bought them. That's wow. your first notice that you you own the property now, <laughs> is the check clears. Wow. So you had you know a couple dozen properties, infill lots in Arkansas that you bought for $50 a piece. Mm -hmm. How did you, what did you do with them? What it like? So I've, I've never been to the area, right? So all I know is what Google says and what the county um, GIS map says. Um, and those aren't always accurate. So I sent out neighbor letters and that worked about 5% of the time. It works. It just doesn't work all the time with 100% efficiency. So that moved a few. Also, I listed on eBay and Facebook. Um, sometimes that works better than others. And usually they'd sell between $500 and $1,000, okay. which is not all the money in the world, but it proves the concept that you can buy at deep discounts and still sell at a discount with a nice margin in the middle. For sure, for sure. And so how long did it take for you to, to dispo those properties? Um, a few months, I'd say probably three or four months. Yeah, not bad, not bad. So, so you're selling these properties and you figure there has to be a better way, right? Yeah, or especially on that one with the half the mobile home. Um, one of the ideas that I bought into is just get a bunch of notes. You know, sometimes if you can't sell it for the cash price, get whatever they have available for the down payment and the rest can be on payments. Well, the challenge is what I learned is there's A, B, C's and D's like, like in school, if these are B's and C property, or if it's half a mobile home, it's probably not even that it's a D property. That's the type of finances that your buyer is probably going to have. And so I sold that one multiple times. And every time someone would come back with a sad story, I would just give them all their money back and say, sorry, it didn't work out. Um, you know, good luck going forward in life. And I realized you are not made for this model. Like you either need to change who you are or the model you're working in. So, you know, I changed my model. Got it. And tell us about that model. How did it, how did it come to be? How did you first get started? Yeah, well, I realized I like doing the underwriting. My personality, it's what's called a quick start, right? I'm easy to get going, but then as soon as I feel like I know what I'm doing and it gets repetitive, then it's better to hand that off to someone else who can keep the machine rolling. Um, so I like underwriting deals and I like finding those high margin opportunities and I had the money to put into deals. So that makes me a lender, right? I'm great with doing that sort of business. I love that. So one of the things that one of the big takeaways from, from that little narrative is find your strength and find what you love to do and lean in. Right. Because there are 
so many different components to this business that you can really find your niche and and go all in, right? Exactly. Yep. And because at the end of the day, your business, well, the way I see it, our business is about helping people, finding what's the way that you can keep yourself from having brain damage while you're helping people. And for us, it's just lending. That's fantastic. So tell us about your your first lending experience. What was that like? How did you find the first property that you lent on? You know, in the beginning, it's not about how much money, it's just about proving the concept, going the right direction. So it's a small loan, like $8,000, really small, not, not even really um, something to get excited about other than the fact that it proved the concept. Um, so it's an $8,000 infill lot, you know, is probably worth triple that, but he was going to sell it for double. And I took a look at the market and I realized everybody out there is trying to fund deals is a joint venture partner, basically an equity funder. And there's nothing wrong with any model. It's just, I feel like maybe I'm a little contrarian and I thought we could do better filling in the knowns instead of unknowns. So when I do the rates, it's based on the principal, not an equity spread. So it's cheaper for the um, partner, the end user who's doing it. And it's less brain damage for me to try to calculate what is the upside. We keep it simple. I love that. And so do you remember your first uh, your first proof of concept that you said, okay, th this I think is going to work? Yeah. Yeah. We loaned for 8,000, sold for 20, 25,000, and it took maybe two months. Well, you know, instead of being an equity partner, getting half that big bite of the apple, you know, mine was based on that 8,000. And so I think I made, you know, less than two thousand dollars. It was it was small, but it proved it worked, and I could prove that hey, people will come back and have multiple loans, and we do a lot of business together, and everybody's happy. I do this amount of work in the category that I like, and everybody else does what they're good at. Yeah, the definition of teamwork. I love that, mm -hmm. and so. You know, I think that what makes uh, what makes your position so fascinating is the fact that you were a land flipper, like the, that you did land deals, and now you're you are lending on land deals. So, can you talk to us a little bit about your business? What type of um, sort of what that value proposition is that that makes you the Brad DeGraw as opposed <laughs> to other uh, hard money lenders out there? Sure. Um, for me, what I like is I like filling in knowns. And what I mean by that is the upside really, to me, it belongs to that person who's really running the business, who's out there doing the marketing, hiring and firing, and, and just dealing with all the things that have to do with the business running well. That upside to me belongs to them. So when I do the fees, it's based on the principal amount lent. And so there's um, a fee per month and we don't do any of um, any monthly uh, payments. So we want to take the best of a JV partner, right? Like no upfront fees, no monthly payments. I get paid at the end when the, the deal goes full cycle. And so we can dive into numbers, you know, towards the end or now or whenever, but we wanted to make sure that we were empowering the person who's actually putting the deals together. That's fantastic. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. That's that's wonderful. I like that a lot. So talk to us about, um, let's say someone has a deal, right? And uh, and they don't know how they can can fund it. They don't they need help closing. What do you look for? How do they you know, what do they need to do? Uh, what are the steps? Let's just say someone has never done lending at all. They're they're new ish to the to the space and they have a deal. What's the next step? Sure. Well, and to me, you have a deal once you have a signed purchase agreement. That's when the deal is a deal. Other than that, you're still in negotiation. You have maybe if you say, Oh, I found a seller who wants to sell and they're agreeable, they like me, that's okay. You're close, but it's not really a deal until you've signed, they've signed the paperwork. Um and I would say you don't necessarily need to start with me or even a lender. Start with the cheaper money. Use your own money. Use your lines of credit, like business, personal, home equity. 
Your friends and family probably have some savings or tax advantaged account. You don't need to start with me. Or if you do want to start with a joint venture partner, they do take a bigger bite of the apple, but they give you experience. You know, they have a ton of ways to put a deal back together when a deal starts to go sideways. That's where they really add in huge value. Um, but yeah, once you have it signed, you say, hey, um, I have a deal. I have a little bit of lead time. It's not trying to close tomorrow. It's at least a week, preferably, you know, more out. Um, send us over your comps, the purchase agreement, and I'll just make sure we're on the same page, right? So if you're comping it and your property maybe doesn't have trees or just a little road frontage and the comps have beautiful trees and views and great road access, we might have to have another conversation on like, how did you get to this value? Where's your logic? And how'd you get to that number? But if we have the same, you know, basic viewpoint on the value, um, then introduce us to the title company as the lender. Um, we'll send over the paperwork for them and closing instructions. And usually if it's closing, let's say the following week or later, it's smooth. If it's if you're trying to close in the same week, then you need to be a really great communicator and everything needs to be smooth. Got it. Yeah. So I think that that's one of the many benefits of working with, um, you know, working with a lender is that they will always do due diligence as well to sort of double check your homework in terms of if this is a this is actually a profitable deal or not. Um, so if you're not super comfortable with uh, with running comps or valuing property, it's kind of like a fail safe, right? Um, in dealing with a lender, if you will. And that's happened a few times. Um, I've caught things that um, were overlooked by the, the land investor. Um, once, you know, there's water that came through the property and said, you know, if you're planning on selling it to a builder, how are they going to build on top of this, you know, water area? And it turned out the value that killed the, the exit strategy that they were looking for and said, hey, do you mind if we throw you under the bus? Like, that's fine. If, if you need to use me as the bad guy, just, you know, say the deal didn't work because of me. Um, another time there was a lien. And this way, work with title companies. Title companies are wonderful um, when they have their exclusions, like what's not covered under the title policy. 99% of the time, there's nothing interesting. But once there is a $40,000 lien from a fence company. Well, that's a lot of equity that just disappears. Yeah. So I reached out to the, you know, the land investor and said, hey, we can't close this until it gets resolved. You know, see if you can get that released. And sure enough, in a few days, they were able to get it worked out. But that little oversight could be a real big challenge after you close. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So, you know, it sounds like there's lots of different fail safes in terms of partnering with a lender to be able to sort of, uh, you know, get your deal done. Can you walk us through what types of, um, you know, what types of processes you go through in qualifying a buyer and qual or a borrower and qualifying a piece of property? What types of things do you look for as a lender? You're asking all the right questions, Kittle. This is why your show is fantastic. Um, for us, lenders think in terms of risk. So there's people, property, and paperwork. So on the people side, we want to make sure they have some track record of success. So if you've you've had success in infill lots and you're borrowing money on infill lots, great. But if this is your very first um, recreational property or large acre and you're going to divide it up, uh, we'd want you to be able to team up with someone who has that level of experience. So experience is one, like a track record of a success, um, not currently in the middle of like a bankruptcy or a divorce. I mean, Knock on wood, hopefully everyone's plans in life stay on track. But if your life's, your financial picture's in turmoil, that makes it hard to lend. Um, those are the big biggies. Um, other than that, we like to see people have a team and systems in place. The better you are at communication, the better your business is going to be. So if you're communicating something weird on the deal, like it says 44 acres, but it might be 75 Tell me up front so that if I'm discovering it, I don't have to have this weird thing like, did you know this property has this huge discrepancy? Um, those things will help create that that relationship of great communication. Got it. And so um, for someone that's never used hard money lending before, um, 
is it based on credit? Is it based on the asset? Uh, how do you view that? And can you explain a little bit more about that? Well, that's the nice thing about this type of business is your bank statements don't matter. Your credit doesn't matter. Last year's taxes, they're, they're not a factor. Really, the underwriting criteria, the thing that gives you credit is that equity spread. So we like to loan up to 50% of market value. For easy math, let's say the market value on a property looks like it's 50,000. That means you'd qualify for up to 25,000 for the purchase. Um, if you have a contract that says you're paying 30,000 for it, that's fine, but 5,000 would have to come out of you know, your pocket and we'd go up to 25. Does that kind of make sense there? Yes, makes total sense. Now, um, we've talked a little bit about how newer people who might be sort of newer to the land business, um, you know, what they can kind of expect with working with hard money lenders. What I would like to know now is from a lender's perspective, um, what types of scenarios do uh, seasoned investors find themselves in that when they work with a hard money lender, it's like adding fuel to the fire and it just catapults them. At what stage in their business, what types of deals that a seasoned investor, once they work with a hard money lender, it's to the races with their success? Yep, I know exactly what you mean by that. The, the phrase we use is our ideal client, that's someone who they're great at getting deals. They have more deals than capital to take the take them down. And so if you're choking with deals, you're just drowning in opportunities and you can't get them all closed because you don't have enough funds to purchase, that's where it really, really makes sense. That's where at the end of the year, you're going to say, man, that was powerful, you know, using that little bit of leverage. Fantastic. And so um, is the process the same um, in terms of how they would uh, you know, show and qualify and that type of thing, or, uh, you know, for a seasoned investor versus a brand new person, for example? Yeah, it's really the same. Um, because uh, if you have a lot of experience, great, share it. If you have lim little or limited experience, that's fine. Um, share what you have. And then also, what makes your model right for you? Like, what research have you done into that market? Do you have some sort of special sauce, some X factor? Go ahead and like sell yourself and your model a little bit because it's a small enough industry. Everyone's going to work with everyone eventually. So, you know, let's let's both wow each other. Yeah, that makes total sense. That's fantastic. So in terms of uh, the, the market that we're in right now, I, I ask this to everyone because I think it's, it's a very um, interesting perspective. Uh, to, to gain from every guest that we've had. And I'm especially interested to hear from you on this topic, but where do you see the market going? And what do you think land investors can do to thrive in the upcoming market shift? Yeah, that's a fantastic question always to be asking everyone. Um, we're entering into a place, from my perspective, ask everyone and you're going to get a variation of, of responses. But from my perspective, what I see is, cash is getting more and more valuable to everyone, both to the sellers, to the buyers, to everyone, which means the, the land investors that we work with, they're able to negotiate deeper discounts. Um, but on the flip side of that, the same case is true for the retail buyers. They're able to shop a little wider variety of properties and negotiate, you know, maybe better discounts or terms so just be prepared for, you might go ahead and start offering uh, deeper discounts or negotiate a little harder for, for that extra time you might be in the deal or that little bit of concessions you might have to give up to the, your retail buyers. Yeah, that's really good. That's good stuff. And so have you found that there is, uh, are people using more hard money, less hard money right now? Like what's the, what are the trends that you're seeing? Well, there's a few. Um, the market prices are trending up. So some of that's um, better quality of deals, right? So some people that we were working with before, maybe they were a little bit newer and um, more agreeable to properties that weren't as premium, as, as desirable. 
So we're seeing people focus on more desirable properties, but also paying more for them. Um, also, what happens is the people we work with, within a year or so, they they grow and their targets move. So you might start with infill lots, then you're doing recreational properties, then you're doing subdivisions. And at that point, it's probably not the best match to work with me. They're working with you know, other folks. So we're seeing both of those trends come true. That is very interesting. Always, always good to, to kind of see patterns and, and see how that's going to affect the market for sure. So um, can you talk us through some of the deals that you've done in terms of like a deal review? That way we can kind of see the magic at work, if you will. Sure. You know, I like to put things in, in buckets. It helps me wrap my mind around it. So there's three types of property that we see the most success with. Infill lots, recreational properties, which are five acres or larger, one to three hours from a population center, and then property on or near water, lakes, rivers, streams, reservoirs, it doesn't really matter, people love water. So those are the property types that we see the most success with. Um, and then the deal structure, there's, again, there's three, uh, transactional funding, which is fantastic. Um, and this is fairly new to us, but um, it's basically you have, you know, an A to B, a B to C, and a title company that's agreeable to making the transaction overlap. That's fantastic because now your risk factor as a land investor, it's narrowed down. You've got all the risk zeroed out. Um, so that's exciting when you can do it. You just have to be a really, you have to be great at juggling and communicating because there's a dozen ways that could get um, sideways. The more traditional transaction we fund is a purchase. The land investor buys it, hires a videographer, does drone video, maybe does um, the modest amount of cleanup and puts a sign in the property. Maybe they do an MLS listing, maybe not. And it'll take anywhere from one to six months with most of them being like two or three months turnaround. And they sell it to a retail buyer. And then the last type of funding we do is like a um, cash out refinance. You know, someone has a really valuable piece of property with no debt and they need money to keep their marketing and all the aspects of their business rolling. And we'll say, okay, we can still loan up to 50% of the value and, you know, use that money to grow your business. So we can talk about specific numbers if you like, but those are kind of the three buckets. Yeah, uh, I definitely do want to jump into numbers, but before we do that, I, um, you know, you really caught my ear with the transactional funding and mitigating the risk. And I think that a lot of people listening um, could really benefit from that. So can you talk a little bit more about um, exactly what that might look like? Can you give an example of when someone might use transactional funding um, to, sure. to do their deal? So a good example would be someone needs to sell the property. Uh, maybe they inherited the property or maybe they have a health issue. One way or another, they'd rather have a small pile of money than that deed. The deed doesn't serve them, but a small pile of money would. And you as the land investor have crossed paths. It's probably direct mail, but it could be anything. Um, and you've had that difficult conversation of, of, of negotiating, why don't you want the property? What's the condition? Here's how our business works. And it's going to be a, a fair price, but not a premium price. And they're patient. They're good communicators. Um, they appreciate that you're there to save them with a small pile of cash. You're not there to make the biggest real estate transaction that county has ever seen. Um, and they're a little bit patient because you've probably explained to them, hey, we have options. Maybe I keep it and hold it in my portfolio. Probably not. I want to see what all my options are. Maybe I exchange it with someone else in my community, you know, and that could be wholesaling. Or maybe I find a really um, motivated buyer who wants to pay a premium more than what I'm willing to pay you. And that would be where my profit comes from that helps me, you know, do this business. And so you've communicated with them that there's options and they're okay with it. They're not confused. And they're not um, trying to work some sort of uh, a deal where, well, maybe you just pay me payments or something. They understand the transaction is going to happen and it's going to happen in the future because you need time to look at your options 
and get the best um, exit for you. Then you go out and you get the buyer, hopefully the retail buyer who's willing to pay, you know, closer to market price. You probably also have a marketing agreement signed so that if that seller says, well, I didn't know you were going to market. No, no, I, you signed it. I explained it. Remember that's your signature. That kind of helps. Um, and then you also need a title company that understands double closings and is comfortable with them. And if so, great. Some title companies will let you use the B to C funds to cover the A to B transaction. Not all states and not all title companies will. Sometimes, and this is where I come in, uh, you need the money for A to B because that's the way the title company wants to see it to cover this uh, B to C transaction. And the money goes out the same day. It can go in the same day and out the same day. Um, does that answer the questions or? Fantastic. And so this is, so just for people listening, this the transactional funding, this is very, very short term loans just to be able to get the transaction closed, right? Yep, exactly. Excellent. And uh, what is your funding rate for transactional funding? Yep. Um, so transactional funding, like you said, it can be one day, it can be one week because there's always a holiday. It ends up, you know, <laughs> 459 on a, uh, a Thursday of a four day weekend. Always. It's, it's 5%. So if you're borrowing, well, I have one on the board uh, for 50,000, that's 2,500. So it's not the absolute cheapest. If you shop around and hunt and hunt, you can find cheaper money. Um, but it's it's better than not being able to do the deal. Absolutely. Fantastic. Now, um, let's take a look at some of those, those numbers that you have now mm -hmm. on some of those deals. Yeah. Yeah. Let's jump into it. So in transactional funding, for example, a $50,000 transaction, let's say that's the A to B. Um, the seller is selling it for $50,000 and maybe they found a buyer for you know, 75 or 80,000. That's great. Even though my bite of the apple would be 2,500, um, there's still plenty of meat on the bone to cover, you know, the title fees, you know, the title company is going to get their bite of the apple as well. You probably had some marketing expenses, um, whether it was a videographer or a real estate broker. Um, so that's a good example of kind of how that might look. Really good. Really good. Nice. And do you have an example of your cash out refinance uh, types of deals? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, this is just a real example. Um, someone needed more money for their business to grow because you know how this is. It's nonlinear. You send out a lot of marketing. Sometimes it's mail. Sometimes you're trying a bunch of other things. And you'll have some misses and then you'll have some ridiculous hits where everyone wants to do business with you all of the sudden. And so that nonlinear um, way of, of response sometimes means you're going to run out of money. So this happened recently. Someone said, hey, I need money to keep growing and I have too many deals going. Um, they had a property worth a quarter million conservatively. And... I said, great. How much do you need? And said, well, I need definitely 70 right away. And then I could use some more to keep everything else um, flowing. I said, well, it looks like 100 is a nice round number. Is that what you're thinking? Yep. Great. And so we went through and made sure the property matched up, right? The, the title work was right and worked with the title company because they issue title insurance to make sure everything's correct. And easy peasy, they had their $100,000. It came through the title company. We always use that escrow service. And they're able to grow their business. And if that property sells, because that's the collateral on the loan, then at that point, we'd get paid from the title company because that's where the transaction would occur. Fantastic. Very, very cool. And then they have the money to, to fund their whatever they need to do for their business or the deal. So that's great. That's great. Now, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, knowing what you know now as a hard money lender, what are some of the biggest challenges that uh, land investors are facing that you know um, are a lot easier to, to overcome with either hard money or anything from your experience as a lender 
um, that could really help people that are, that's often overlooked? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because money is a very old product, right? It never expires. It never goes out of season. So your, your purchasing power is just one tool in your toolkit. What I'd encourage people to um, kind of just have a mental exercise, just stretch your thinking a little bit. I'm only one source of money. Sometimes possibly the absolute best source would be the seller. If you could get the seller to hold on and let you tie up the property while you find that in buyer, great, that's free. There's no interest on that. There's, there's no complication. So some people have had great success in um, getting long periods for due diligence or just saying, hey, could I, could I give you an option fee, right? That's a fee for that longer period. Or say, I'll give you, here's a good example of a deal. It's a neighborhood we knew would sell for 30,000. All day, every day, it's a repeat neighborhood. We're doing business there. Well, the seller, usually she could sell, she could buy the properties for 15, sell it for 30. She had a hard-headed seller that said, nope, I'm going to sell it for 21, 22,000. That's it. But she already had a buyer's list. She already had a, a proven model and said, well, I'm sorry, I can only go up to 50%, which is 15,000. Um, could you get the seller to carry back a note for that, you know, $7,000? And she was able to talk the seller into selling it at 22, but only getting 15,000 until she found the second side of the transaction closed. So something like that helps. So again, it's less money borrowed from me and more money or time borrowed from the seller. So that's very cool. Yeah, it's that's super cool. The creative opportunities out there are just endless, right? Yep. Especially because you know, for me, it's a business. And so um, every dollar, every day, the meter is turning, but for the seller, um, it's not a professional business. They're just wanting that headache. And, you know, sometimes the land is stressful to them. They want that to go away and be replaced with money. And they know that it, it's going to take a while. So you might be able to get that for free. That is very cool. I, great advice there. Um, what are some other opportunities that you're seeing that that exists in the land space that people are not really capitalizing on right now? You know, I'm a bit, I'm, I'm a technology dork. I like chat GPT. I think that's one of the coolest things out there and just be ready for new innovations to spin off of that. Um, so, you know, consider using chat GPT for maybe marketing, like write ad copy for this parcel in this county, or Hey, tell me about the nearby communities. What makes those places interesting to prospective buyers? And so you could have chat GPT research things that you wouldn't be able to research because maybe it's a seasonal festival and it's not coming up right now in Google because no one's looking for it right now. So think about that. Um, plug into communities and just keep your ears open for, for technology and opportunities. That's really fantastic. I, I'm a huge AI fan. I think that we're just now scratching the surface of what it can do to help our businesses. Um, what are some other tools that you really like that can that come to mind in the land space or that help you in your land business? You know, anything that can save me um, reduce errors or time invested. Um, so you know, it's, it's not my tool, but I'm a fan of it. Price Boss, for example, um, we're all using the same data, right? We're trying to land sites or the Zillow, or we're all trying to gather the same thing, but rather than having multiple tabs and multiple screens, having something that kind of collates that data and shows you the outliers, that's helpful, but you still need to, you know, read the descriptions and see, was that um, with seller finance or did this have a lot of trees or road frontage? you're still probably going to have to put your eyes onto the words on the screen, but something like that can, that can help collate data is fantastic. Very cool. Price boss, right? Is that what it was? Yep. Yeah. Price boss. Yeah. Definitely going to check that out. That's amazing. So um, what are some of the, like, are there uh, certain entrepreneurs or business owners that you really like to follow? 
Um, a little bit of everyone. You obviously. I'm here. Oh. <laughs> Almost oh. all of your lives. I'm. I'm here. Um, uh, AJ and Jason have one that's that's fantastic. I like the live interaction with people because I think you get more than just reading the book and catching the podcast. So anywhere that there's a live community, I find there's a lot of value there because you can dive deeper rather than just kind of a superficial, you know, glossing over a topic. That's a really good piece of advice. Getting into those live communities that you can actually have dialogue and like you said, the books are fantastic and there's so much great content out there, but whenever you can interface live with people, especially within a particular container or community, it's really, it's really very cool. Um, what's the biggest surprise you've had so far on your journey in real estate? Oh, you know, my understanding of the business continues to evolve. You know, what we're doing and how we're doing it so for example, on the lending side, who I help is people with more opportunity than capital. And then when I run out of capital, I have to go reach out to capital providers like business partners and say, you know what? It looks like you have more capital than you know double digit opportunities to deploy it. Can we work together? And it's interesting that you're always out there solving problems, but the better you can define and explain and understand that problem, the, the faster you're going to be able to get to that solution. That's really good. That is really good. Now, if you could go back and tell yourself three pieces of advice as a novice, what would it be? Um, get started. Um, expect that it's going to change. And build relationships. I think those are three solid tips. Those are really, really good. Get started. I, there are so many people, myself included, uh, before I got into real estate, you know, it feels so good to like do all of the real estate things like watching the shows and listening to the podcast and reading the books and you feel like you're doing real estate. But until you're actually doing deals and like you mentioned earlier, getting a deal doesn't just mean you're like contacting people. That means you have a signed contract that's ready to go, right? And so taking action, getting started, that is so super important. So completely, completely agree with that. Uh, what's your biggest passion or goal you'd like to achieve at this point in your life? Um, you know, my wife and I, our, our way to leave the world a better place is to to finance kids education so you know we think the world would be better with more medical professionals and teachers and educators and so that's where we put like it's it's in the background no one really sees it but i think that's a better way for us to leave the world a better place because does the world really need more lenders or marketers probably not it's not going to be necessarily a better place but if we had more educators and you know medical professionals that works. And I'm too young. Or I'm, I passed the window where it makes sense for me to go to school. So we finance other people's education. That is very cool. What a really cool way to give back. That's awesome. Yeah. And so what makes you feel like your best self? Like what, what area of life, what is it that makes you feel inspired? You know, when deals come together, it's rewarding both financially and emotionally, but I'd have to lean back into like the kids. Like next year we have three kids graduating from medical school and it's it's a huge accomplishment for them. And all we did was write the checks, you know? Wow, that's remarkable. That is, that's very, very cool. It must be a huge sense of fulfillment as well to be able to um, contribute in that way, you know? For sure. Nice. What would you consider your superpower to be? <sighs> Getting started, <laughs> I'm a quick start. I, I love to dive into it and figure it out. And then once there's a rhythm to it and the, it starts to become a system, then handing it off. And my wife is perfect. She has that counterbalancing. She's a due diligence person. So she has that fact finding capacity. So getting started and then handing it off. 
That's really good. Getting started knowing when to get out of the way, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. And so, yeah, I just want to thank you so much for giving to us today. Um, is there anything that, that you're looking for right now that we could help you with? Are there any types of connections or resources you're looking for in our community that we could help with? You know, I'm always happy to connect, you know, just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. If you need a second set of eyes on a deal, it doesn't mean we have to do business together, but if a deal just, you're kind of stuck and you want a second set of eyes, I'm happy to do it. If anyone's in the DFW area and wants some uh, Tex-Mex or barbecue, hit me up. Um, there's so many good places to eat here. So I think that's it, just connection. That's fantastic. And how do people connect with you? Where can they find you to connect with you? Um, I'm easy to find on Facebook um, or our website has a link to book a call. Um, I can put that in the chat. It's allterraincapital.net. And it's not a plug. You don't have to like do business with us, but that's the easiest way to jump into my calendar. And for you that I just thought of, uh, what as your as a lender in your experience, what's been the coolest deal that you've worked on that that you say, you know what, this shows the true power of like, of teaming up with a lender and making things happen? You know, just about every deal, we get that, oh my goodness, thank you for being part of this. Without this, we couldn't have made this deal work. Um, because I think it happens where people think they can have the money together and they don't, or a lender says they have the money and then they don't. We've never left anyone at the altar disappointed, but we've had to save the day where others have said, oh yeah, there'll be money. And then, you know, closings at the end of the week and there's no money. So being there right at the uh, finish line with all the money is fantastic. Sometimes a property is really interesting. Like the features of a property are interesting. And there's one that kind of stands out. There was a property, I want to say it was in Tennessee. It was like 14 acres, not the biggest. And from the air, it looked like just a prairie with some trees here and there but it had a subterranean facility, like a 10,000 square foot, like underground bunker. And it was abandoned for like a decade or more. So it wasn't like someone could turn the lights on and use it, but you know, it was either the bunker for like a superhero or villain. <laughs> and that must've had a really specific buyer because you wouldn't just, you know, buy something like that unless you had a plan. And so that one was really, really interesting. That is very cool. How did you, I mean, I know that part of the, the process is figuring out uh, value for a property. How did, how did that affect the value? How did you evaluate that? Love your questions. Um, for us, we see zero value in the structure. And that keeps it simple because it's hard to find another, you know, Batman or Darth Vader you know, <laughs> villain uh, cave. So if there's a, a structure that's half built or you know secret facility underground, we comp it as if there's nothing there at all. Um, for one, it makes it easier. And two, it's more conservative. That makes total sense. Yeah, not a whole lot of, uh, of uh, villain layers on the comp sheet uh, out there, but that definitely makes sense. While they're chatting, I'll give you some more tips just from yes. the Linux perspective. Yes, please. When you're out there shopping, there are plenty of tricks that lenders can use to make you get excited about some numbers over here or there. Don't worry about percentages. If you're going to shop and try to compare apples to apples, look at your dollars per day. That's how you can really figure out what's your cost of money. So again, don't worry about this percent higher or lower than another one. Figure out, okay, I'm probably going to need the money for three months, 90 days. What are my total cost? Any fees, any anything that's going to add into my cost, add it up and then divide that by the number of days you're going to need the money. And now you can start to compare because there's plenty of ways to do like prepaid interest or upfront fees that look innocent, but they really change the cost of your money. That is really good. And I think that's something I know that it can be very easy to overlook and not think about is the cost of money, uh, especially whenever it's whenever it's figured that way. You know, it's really, really good. Thank you for that nugget. 
Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us, Brad. I want to thank you so much for being so generous with your time. This has just been absolutely fantastic. If you have not subscribed yet to the podcast, you can do that. There, We have links in the uh, chat box. You can see our different links, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. We also have a website, onlylandfans.com. If you've not uh, signed up to be part of our group, please do that. We love to have as many different perspectives in the community. It just makes it a much richer community of different land investors from all different walks of life and all different experience levels. And also, uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. We also do these video podcasts. We have this format on the, on the uh, YouTube channel. And I also have some educational videos that I put out as well that kind of showcases some of the deals that I've done in the past. And so would love to have you guys check that out. Um, as always, so delighted to have everyone. Again, Brad, thank you so much. You're just, a, just absolutely awesome. Loved having you. So everyone, be great. We will see you next week. We do these every single Thursday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Be great. Have a great week. And we'll catch you in the next one. If you're interested in hearing from other six and seven figure land flippers about how they built and run their businesses, then check out my group, Only Land Fans, where I do a live interview each week inside the group. You can grab that link at the description below. Until then, be great, have a great week, and catch you in the next one.